All right, we have a, a wonderful opportunity, and the timing was just right. Uh, Robin has uh, been on a trip to New Zealand to go and uh, be part of uh, uh, a group coming from the U.S. of uh, Chosen People Ministry U.S. leaders. Went to go and have a look to see what God is doing in New Zealand. And yes, God is doing great things in New Zealand. And uh, it's been wonderful to watch the ministry in New Zealand grow over the many years that it's taken place there. Uh, and uh, the, they had a tour of uh, the South Island and also the various uh, places where ministry is done in New Zealand and Wanaka, at a place uh, that we call Zula in Wanaka. That's uh, where we got the name for our Zula Roo. And uh, it's a great lodge there. And then also Pun Punukaiki up on the west coast as well. So Robin was there. She's been many times to New Zealand. And now has only just come to Australia. So, yeah, we, I'll, I'll forgive you. Next week, next week's prayer. All right, so finally Robin's come. And she is, um, her work is with Chosen People Ministries in Israel in particular. She's the director of the work in the Tel Aviv area, and she'll tell you more about that. But uh, Robin is a globe trotter. And, uh, you know, somebody once said she's like that Carmen Diego. What's it, Carmen Diego, the person who just travels around the world? There's some kind of game called that. You'll... Carmen what? San Diego. San Diego. Oh, okay. All right, you're all looking blank. That's okay. <laughs> she does a great job. She coordinates the international ministry and particularly reaching out to Israeli backpackers. And uh, it's a very exciting ministry. So let, uh, let us welcome Robin to come and share with us this morning. Shalom. It is an amazing honor and privilege to be here. I have known Lawrence and Louise for, I think, about 15 years. And we have the privilege often of serving together at young adult conferences. And if you know them, you know when they walk into a room, they bring the love and joy of the Lord with them in a very unique and special way. So I'm so glad to finally be here, and we'll need to pray they forgive me. <laughs> um, how does a nice, traditional Jewish girl from Brooklyn come to stand in your Messianic congregation today? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> um, I grew up in a traditional home in Brooklyn, New York. My mom was a single mom, so I lived with my grandparents, and my grandparents loved being Jewish more than anyone could love being Jewish. <laughs> How many of you have seen Fiddler on the Roof? Yes. This is my grandparents' story. You know my grandparents. <laughs> um, sadly, they, they lived in Russia, and they suffered pogroms, and they moved and they moved, till finally they said, we can't take this anymore. It's time to go to the Jewish Holy Land, Brooklyn. <laughs> and they, they made their way through a secret underground to New York, and I grew up in their home where they continued to help Jewish people um, get out of Russia before that was really possible. My grandfather went to synagogue every day. We belonged seriously to two synagogues across the street from each other, one that was our regular and one where he went when he was arguing with that rabbi. <laughs> I, and he loved God. He loved the word of God. And when my grandfather told me the stories from the Torah, I really believed that Moses was in his Bible study group. Moses told him firsthand, and he came and told us. We grew up knowing a real God who could part the Red Sea. But by the time I was in high school, I was living one foot in and one foot over. I still kept kosher. I still kept all the holidays. I loved being Jewish. I believed there was a living God but I was also going to the clubs in New York City and partying and doing drugs. And my friends would always say, Robin, how is it that you won't eat a lobster, but you'll use drugs? And I said, well, Moses said, don't eat lobster. But, 
The Bible does say have a sound mind. I'm not advocating for drug use, but that's how I was living. I was living,、uh, you know, some of the law, but I was also、um, living out a wild side. And part of it too was when I was growing up, there was someone in my life who was very violent and very、um, abusive. And then in high school, a very good friend of mine was killed in a terrible. Uh, crime, and my first year of college, my grandmother was killed in a break-in in her apartment. When you, I had rules. I thought I, I have good grades. I go to a good school, so I had rules to make sure I didn't have a problem. You use drug and alcohol only when you're already having fun to enhance the fun. Then you don't have a problem. You use drugs and alcohol only when you're with other people. Then it's social. Then you don't have a problem. But when you start to go through all these tragic things, when my grandmother was killed, when I came back to college, I just couldn't deal with life. I became afraid to go out, the party girl, afraid to go out, afraid to go to parties.、Um, I was fearful of everything, and I was angry at the world and at everything and everyone. And I started just to use drugs and alcohol alone to not deal with the pain of these things. I didn't know it, but I had hepatitis B. I had liver disease, and very quickly it got so bad I had heart problems and kidney problems, and I had to leave school because I was too sick. When I came back home, the doctors told my parents I wouldn't make it to my 21st birthday, and that's what I looked like. I do you use pounds here or kilograms? <laughs> oh dear. Well, I, I was so thin, my bones were sticking out. My eyes, my skin was yellow. My hair was falling out. I mean, people would stare at me. I looked sick, and I was weak. When I would stand up, I'd often pass out. Very weak. And the doctors told my parents, "There's nothing more we can do. We tried alternative medicine, we tried Western medicine, we tried everything." And my mom had a friend in high school who she rebumped into, who was a Jewish believer in Yeshua. And she would tell me two things every day. She would say, "Robin, I want to tell you about the Messiah." And I would say, "Okay, that's fine, but none of this New Testament. I don't want to hear it." When we were kids, some of the kids who wore crosses called us Christ killers and punched us. There was no way I wanted to hear anything from the New Testament. I was sure it was anti-Semitic. So I said, "If you want to talk about the Messiah, I'm open. But if he's the true Messiah, we, you can show it to me in the Hebrew Scriptures." And the second thing she said was, "We're going to take you to church and pray for you, and God will heal you." And I said that will never happen. I will never step foot in a church. So every day she'd come over and she would share a prophecy about the Messiah with me, and I would get furious at her, and say, blah, 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 argue with her about its meaning, its interpretation. And she was wonderful. She never fought back. She would just say, "I guess you've had enough for today. Bye. See you tomorrow." And she'd come back the next day, all cheery again. She reminds me a lot of you, Louise. <laughs> she'd come back the next day, all cheery again, share with me a messianic prophecy. When I, I and I would argue with her all the time. But what I never told her was I couldn't sleep at night, thinking, who are these prophecies talking about? Because it sounds like Jesus, but I don't want it to be. And one day she read me Isaiah 53. A very clear picture of the one who suffers and dies for our sin, and I freaked out and said, "That's it. Now we're done for good. Don't just say bye bye and come back tomorrow. I don't trust you anymore. You're sneaking in New Testament. This is clearly Jesus. This is clearly New Testament." And she said, "Okay, I'll leave and never come back again if you read one last thing." And she went to the back of our house, to the den, in a bookcase where we had books that my grandparents had brought from Israel, including a Tanakh. And she pulled out our family Tanakh, no New Testament there, opened it to Isaiah 53, and said, "Read it in your own Bible." And as I read this clear picture of the one who suffered and died for our sins in my Bible, 
Everything I fought with, Jeremiah 31, Daniel, all the prophecies started to string together, and I knew Jesus is the Messiah. Yeshua is the Messiah. She said to me, tomorrow, she went to a Messianic congregation, but she said to me, tomorrow, I'm going to take you to a church where they have a healing ministry. We're going to pray for you, and God's going to heal you. So we go to this church. I'm very nervous walking in. And they have crutches and wheelchairs and hospital beds hanging from the rafters. They had rafters like this and on the walls of all the people who had been healed. I've not been in a church before, and I'm thinking, are all churches decorated like this? Because it's very strange. <laughs> After the service, they bring me up front, and the pastor lays his hand on my head and prays for me. And my mom's friend, she had this amazing faith and she thought I was immediately going to look healthy. And you know what? God can do that. But he didn't. So she starts to walk away, and she goes, oh, it didn't work. And I'm standing there, and I mean, I can feel it when I say it. I'm like, I don't know what just happened to me, but I feel like there were chains on me, and they fell off. And I feel like I was sleeping my entire life, and I just woke up. I feel alive for the first time in my life. And I was like shaking. And she came back, and she said, you just met Yeshua. Yesterday you met him here, but now you've met him here. And I said, yeah, I've met Yeshua. And I went home and I said, well, I'm not going to go to church again. That was really weird. Um, <laughs> But I think I should read the New Testament and read a gospel and read more about Yeshua. And I was still afraid that I was going to find out I was betraying my people and betraying my Judaism. As I opened it, I was shocked because everyone told me Yeshua is Jew Jewish. Yeshua is Jewish. No one told me Matthew, Mark, Peter, Paul. Everybody is Jewish. <laughs> The only one who might not be is Luke, but he's a doctor, so let's say he's Jewish. <laughs> they are all Jewish, and they're having the same conversations I was having and the same questions I was having. They were having, it was just like reading about my family. And I could not put down this book. And I want to say, if you haven't, you know, it's really good to do like deep study, like you read a verse and you figure out what every word means in its original Hebrew and Greek. But once in a while, we miss the whole story and the whole picture of God's love if we don't read through a book. So sitting and reading through the whole New Testament like that, if you haven't read through a whole gospel, just straight through quickly, just read the story, do it. It's amazing. Um, I did it with the book of Deuteronomy and I was shocked that all I got from it was love, mercy, love, mercy. You know, we think it's law, it's love, mercy. So when I finished reading the New Testament, I knew three things. I knew this is a Jewish book. Of course, it's for everyone, but we, I thought it wasn't for my people, and it is. Jesus loves us more than anyone can love us. I am a tough New Yorker, and I wept through the Gospels, seeing Jesus' love for his disciples and for us. And the third thing I knew was, I had to go and tell this to my people Israel. Like, how did I never hear this before? How was I 20 years old, and I never heard Jesus rose from the dead, and I never heard he's the Jewish Messiah who fulfills the prophecies? I never heard any of it before. My life was transformed. Um, I knew I was called to Israel, and I would tell people that, and they would go, you're not going to Israel, you're going to die, you're terminally ill. <laughs> and I stopped telling people. I was like, don't you have faith? Don't you know God? God called me to Israel. And during that time, I couldn't work. I couldn't go to school. I only sometimes could come to a congregation because I passed out a lot when I stood up. But that was one of the best times in my life because I spent time praying and reading the word. And one day during prayer, the Lord really spoke to me about forgiving the people who had hurt me. Forgiving the people who had hurt my family members. 
and about my fear, giving my fear to him and letting him into it. And he gave me certain verses to speak into it. And as I prayed into that, he gave me the grace and strength to forgive in a way that is not humanly possible. <laughs> and it set me free. And then one day, I was in a regular service, no special speaker on healing, and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, go up and ask for prayer. Today is the day I'm going to heal you. And you can imagine, people were always praying for me, bringing me to special services. And it was full, like this room is full. And I said, I don't want to go up in front of all these people. I may pass out. I look terrible. I'm so sick. I'll go to a small group tonight. And the Lord spoke to my heart, go up and ask for prayer. I'm going to heal you. And I went up. They prayed for me, just walked away. Every Monday I went for blood work and every Wednesday they adjusted my medicine. Monday I went for blood work, Wednesday I came in and they said, they mixed up your blood at the lab, we have to redo the test, come back Friday. They took blood, I come back Friday and they were looking at me like they were looking at a ghost. What happened? I said, what do you mean what happened? They said, Wednesday your blood came back, totally normal. That's not possible. <laughs> When you have liver disease, your blood is like this, but also hepatitis B has a marker that's forever. So we redid your blood work and it came back again, normal. No marker for hepatitis B. How did this happen? Yes. Praise God. I told him my story, and the doctor said, I don't know what I believe, but three times in my life I saw something that cannot be explained by science, and all three times was a story just like yours. God healed me completely. As you heard, I now, I went to Israel. The first thing I did was I went to Israel. <laughs> and there my family took me to anti-missionaries uh, to like unbrainwash me from believing in Jesus, which strengthened my faith, actually. All the questions they brought up, the answers are in the Word of God. It made me dive into the Word of God and it strengthened my faith. Um, but, as you heard, I've also really had a heart for Israelis who all serve the army, men and women, and then they go traveling the world, and they're seeking meaning and answers to life. I meet people who want to know God, in a non-religious way. I meet people who want to know the meaning of life and what's their purpose. And when I was doing a lot of the traveling to India, I had to take malaria pills. And the doctor said, you're taking these a lot. I think we should um, test your liver because of your history. I said, what history? God healed me. He said, well, humor me. Let me do a test. And they did all the tests on my liver. And he called me up. He said, I was at the time like 45. He called me up. He said, you have a 20-year-old liver. I said, a 20-year-old frat boy? <laughs> and he said, no. He said, everyone your age has some marks or scarring on their liver, but yours is perfect. I said, maybe he gave me a new one. Maybe it is 20 years old. So praise the Lord. But the thing that was really important for me to look in my story is from Isaiah 53, the very verse that God used to open my eyes that he is Messiah. I just want to read a quick bit of it. if my phone will cooperate. There we go. Um, it says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, or some versions say by his stripes, we are healed, I believe he healed me spiritually when he opened my eyes to show me he was the Messiah who came to reconnect me to God and all of us who believe. He healed me emotionally when he showed me to forgive. And he took, you know, there's so many verses about him giving us peace beyond our understanding. And then he healed me physically. So by his stripes, we can be healed. So powerful. Um, I want to share with you a little bit about the ministry he called me to because after all that, I went to Israel. I started doing ministry. When I met with, I worked for Chosen People Ministries, as Lauren said, and when I started, I started in New York. And when I met with the president, he said, what will your ministry be? And I said, I'm going to drink coffee with Israelis. 
he laughed at me too. He laughed. He said, "That's very nice, but what will your ministry be?" I said, "Nope, that's my ministry. I drink coffee with Israelis. I'm going to go to India and drink tea, chai with Israelis, and I'm going to bring others along and teach them how to do the same." And after I came back from the first trip to India, and he heard the stories of how open, how curious, how wonderful the conversations are with traveling Israelis, he called me and said. Why don't you go to New Zealand and work with our staff there and do some outreach there? Then, some years later, the Lord called me to Israel to live in Israel, and I think this video can tell about our work in a more clear way. So let's watch that for a moment. Tel Aviv is a very vibrant and diverse city. Israelis from all over the country love to visit. We have a thriving ministry center in Tel Aviv, reaching this young and energetic population. Let me share some facts about Tel Aviv with you before explaining our ministry focus. The city has grown from a small neighborhood to a major cosmopolitan city in slightly more than 100 years, and it is still thriving today. The history of Tel Aviv begins in 1909 when a few dozen families founded what they call a Kudrat Bayit, which is roughly translated as homestead. One of Tel Aviv's most significant population booms came between 1929 and 1939, during which the population grew from 4,000 to 135,000 residents. These were mostly immigrants fleeing persecution in Europe and included many scholars, physicians, and lawyers who greatly enriched the culture of the Jewish city. Now the Tel Aviv metropolitan area is booming in population. Today, Tel Aviv is Israel's economic and cultural center. Tel Aviv is filled with hip cafes where young Israeli professionals can operate their mobile offices and have their business meetings. It boasts of a diverse population. Every Jewish ethnic group is represented as well as many foreign workers, college students, and lots of young people getting started in life. It is a predominantly young population, but there are also many elderly and Holocaust survivors who love the young vibe of the city, and they love the cultural events and the ease of walking down the road for all their needs. With this background, let me now describe how Chosen People Ministries is ministering to the people of Tel Aviv. We have built a strong social community around our ministry center, which is a safe place for people from all walks of life come and fellowship, meet people, and enjoy God's presence, whether they believe in Him yet or not. We recognize Tel Aviv is a predominantly secular place with a huge population of unreached Jewish people, many who are seeking spiritual answers and a deeper meaning to life. Our center provides opportunities for people to get out, to get to know each other, and to find some of these answers to their questions. Our ministry center hosts cultural events and concerts, as well as Shabbat dinners and holiday dinners. We also conduct worship night, Bible studies, and seminars for those who are seeking a spiritual experience. In addition, we plan events for Holocaust survivors, children, and young adults. Our Tel Aviv Messianic Center is strategically located amid more than four million Israelis. It is our hope that many of the people of Tel Aviv will come to know Jesus as their Messiah, the Messiah of Israel. We also want to continue to build our community where believers can grow in their faith through our events and Bible studies. We're excited to see what more the Lord has in store for this beautiful and vibrant city, Tel Aviv. The city. So you see, it's like a community center with a faith base. We have people coming in all the time, believers, non-believers. It's a wonderful atmosphere, an easy place to ask questions and to build relationships. On October 7th, I hope I'm going to be able to even share that. I haven't spoken in front of a group about October 7th, really, um, except in Mohan. Um, on October 7th, I was home in Tel Aviv, and we heard the sirens go off. I had a guest staying with me. I went knocking on their room, come, come to the safe room. We came into the safe room, and 
we went online, and not long after, we started to see the scenes of、uh, Noah Agarmani being taken on a motorcycle, of others. Um, the Bibas family, the Bibas mom with the two children in her arms, being taken away, and we realized this is not.、Um, and I hate to say this because it shouldn't be usual that someone gets rockets, but this is not just usual exchange of some rockets. There's something much bigger happening and something much more horrific.、Um, all of you know the details、um, of the day. I thank you for having the wall. With the hostages' faces and those who are free and home, and to reminder to pray for them.、Um, I want to tell you that very quickly, everyone in the country went into action to help each other. People were immediately displaced、uh, from the south. Soon after, from the north,、um, they left with almost nothing and needed help. They needed daily food. They needed clothing. They needed toys for their children, and everyone started to serve. Our ministry, the Ministry Sent You store, looked like a warehouse. We started finding out that the IDF needed thermals and needed headlamps and needed, you know, protection pads. And well, you know, everything happened so quickly. It took a little while for the army to catch up in distributing things.、Um, and the things that the soldiers are supposed to buy, they had no time for. Many of them were out traveling and were called back to come serve. So we started supplying those things. We started providing food for Holocaust survivors and elderly were terrified to go out. There were rockets constantly, even in the center of Tel Aviv.、Um, I went out. They told us to prepare in case we had to stay in our shelters to get these radios that work on battery. And I went out and on this little errand twice had to run into strangers' buildings and seek shelter.、Um, so we had to provide food for the people who couldn't go out. Uh, all the men got called up. Women are home with four children. How do you run to shelter if it's not inside your own apartment with four children who are small? So we went immediately into relief work and started doing a lot of relief work. Things have shifted a bit now, and now we realize the biggest need is emotional support.、Uh, we don't even ask each other how are you. It's how are you holding up. Um, I spend a lot of time going to Hostage Square. It's an area outside the Tel Aviv Museum, where the hostage families can come. There's a private area just for them, where there, there's food, they can have massages, there's therapists available. But it, they come outside to the square where there's art and exhibits that show the story of the hostages. The long table, some of you have seen on social media, of the Shabbat table waiting for their return. Um, and the hostage families wear things to identify themselves, and so many of them do want to talk, and they feel so alone. They see on the news people ripping down the posters, and when I tell them that there are believers all around the world that are praying and praying for them by name, they know their stories. They start to cry. One of the young women,、uh, Leary, who's still being held. I met her mother the first week, and when I, she said, "No one hears us. We don't have a voice. We're such a small country." And I said, "There are believers all over the world who are praying for your daughter. There are believers all over the world who care and are standing with us." She grabbed me and hugged me and started to cry. And as I walked away, some of her friends came and said, "You don't know how much that meant." Because we feel all alone, so thank you for standing with us. Thank you for praying. Thank you for those who do reach out to government officials to make noise and get attention.、Um, I'm wearing this.、Um, they give them. They have them at Hostage Square. It says, "Bring them home" in English, but in Hebrew, it says, "Our hearts are captive in Gaza," because they are.、Um, none of us don't know someone who was impacted in some way. Uh, a young man that I know that I met, backpacking,、uh, was killed on October 7th as he went out to protect his kibbutz.、Um, he actually did.、Um, it, seven men went out; two were killed in a battle with Hamas, but the rest of their kibbutz escaped.、Um, but it is so difficult and so hard, and that's why I also love this 
ministry that you're starting at Apollo Bay because our people need comfort. They need to know they're loved. They need to know they're safe. Recently, there was a list put out saying these are the country's uh, safety levels. And most countries became a step or two less safe for Israelis to travel in. It's the first time in my life I feel concerned traveling in some parts of the world when they ask to see my passport or see my name. Um, so to know that there's a network of people who love God and love Israel and love the Israelis and just want to bless them is so powerful always. But what it's going to mean from now over the next couple of years, as people are released from the army, as things hopefully soon uh, come to a stable security situation, as our hostages come home safe, um, people are going to be out. They need to get out to breathe. The intensity in Israel is really something you can feel. Um, and I'm so thankful to know how they're going to be welcomed here. The, not just the place I saw was wonderful and relaxing as soon as you arrived, but the people I met, some of you hosting already in your homes, the love and the kindness. Um, I, I just can't put words on how much that means, so thank you so much. And um, Louise asked me when I uh, finished sharing to give a bit of a challenge, and my, my challenge is to ask God, what is your role right now? Because the world feels upside down. I read the news and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, right is wrong and wrong is right and nothing makes sense. And so much is focused on hatred towards Israel and the Jewish people. Um, how do we stand together as a community? How do you stand with the community? What's your role in showing that love? And some simple things, prayer and speaking up, using social media, hosting, just inviting an Israeli traveler um, to stay and be a guest, um, and encouraging one another. Because we're all in this too. We, just, we had a seminar um, on how to deal with trauma, and the first thing they said is, well, you guys are trying to help everyone around you. You're in the trauma too. You know, we're a Messianic Jewish community. We're, we're feeling the pain of this too. So how do we help each other to um, be strong and be encouraged that God is with us and God loves Israel and God loves his people. And so I just want to challenge you to pray, what is my role in this time in history? What does God want me to do? Um, and to really encourage you to step into that. So I'm going to close with a prayer. Um, Abba, Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here amongst people who love you so dearly. Father, we lift up Israel, and we pray, Lord, that your love and your comfort would be felt and experienced, that people would just sense you in a way like they never have. Um, and cry out to you and see who you really are. We pray it's a time that many would come to know the truth of your love, the Messiah. Father, I pray for the hostages, that you're with them, that you keep them safe and bring them home quickly. I pray for their families and the pain they're going through. I pray for all those who are mourning in Zion, Lord. We're to mourn with those who mourn and comfort your people. Help us know the best ways to comfort your people, Lord. Pray for all those who are mourning a loss now. And Lord, we pray for security and peace to return to Israel, Lord. Um, and we pray that people would know the Prince of Peace. Lord, I pray for Australia. I pray that here in Melbourne, um, the Jewish community would be safe, that they would know that you love them, and that there would be many opportunities to walk alongside our neighbors and friends and share your love, Lord. I pray that many, many, many would know your love in a tangible life tr transition, transitioning, transformational way. And Lord, 
as you opened my eyes spiritually, as you healed me spiritually and emotionally and physically, there's so many who need still some of that healing, Lord. All of us, it's a journey, this life, it beats you up and you need again to come afresh to the Lord. I pray that we would all come to you for that healing. And then, Lord, uh, as I put forth the challenge, that we would seek you for what you're calling us to and find strength in you to walk in that thing. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you so much, Robin, for a very inspiring testimony and also a very moving story about what's going on in Israel. And yeah, we all feel it and we're all part of the story even though we are so far away. But thank you also for that challenge that you gave to us as well to see what is the Lord calling us to do. And there's so much I'm sure that God will put on your heart. But you know, this is the time for us in Australia to, to do something very, very tangible. Yesterday was Australia Day. It's time for us to step up as a nation. And the opportunity that we have right now to provide a place for Israelis to come and feel comfortable and feel happy that they're loved and they, they can be embraced. This is the time for Australia to step up and be that nation. And the timing of our decision to buy that house down in Apollo Bay was on the 6th of October. We signed a, a, um, an offer on the 6th of October. And on the week of the war, the first week, that's when the offer was accepted. It was prophetic that God called us to do that. And now we have a chance to step up as a nation and to do something. And as you, you know, we've bought the premises and now we need to pay for it. And so our appeal is to, to Australia, really, to all of Australia to step up and help us pay for this place. And for Australians all around the country to open up their homes to Israelis. And so we, as a ministry of Celebrate Messiah, have got this hosting network, hostisraelis.com.au, where you could become a host, and where Israelis then can find you online. We have a special app for that called Planet Zula. And also now we have a home in Apollo Bay that is just wonderful. For the folks that came down yesterday, you've seen it. People were moved by what a wonderful place it is, what a wonderful family we have staying there, and it's just an opportunity for us, and so we are making our appeal to all of Australia to step up and to provide this place for Israelis. We've purchased the house, we now, we purchased the house for, for $1.7 million, $250,000. We've uh, been given almost, uh, I think, about $400,000 now as a deposit, and we have the rest to pay off. Every month, it's quite a big sum to pay the bank back, even though it was a miracle we got the loan in the first place. But we don't want to be paying the bank for very long. So we need God to do a miracle in providing for this place so that we can step up as a nation. We can do something to help Israelis as they come to our shores. We want them to know it's a safe place to come to. Even though there's so much anti-Semitism has bubbled up out of the surface, but I was really heartened. We had Israelis come and stay with us uh, two nights ago, and they told a story of how they, they went into a shop, and the lady behind the counter said, so where are you from? And you know, if you're Israeli, you, you're very kind of reticent to say where you're from right now. But they said, are we Israeli? And she said, oh, that's wonderful. Come here. I want to give you a hug. And I want to just show you my love and support. And they said it was just amazing. Then they went to an art shop, an Aboriginal art shop in Cairns. They went in, and the guy behind the, behind, uh, in the art shop said, Oh, you Israeli? And they said, Yes. And he said, Shalom. And it turned out to be probably the one indigenous person in Australia that loves Israel the most. <laughs> and that is uh, Norman Miller. Uh, and many of you know Norman and Barbara Miller. And so they walked into that shop by chance and got a big hug and love and a book of art from Norman Miller. So 
what wonderful things and what great opportunities we have in this country to do something tangible for Israel. As we pray for peace in the Middle East, for everyone, we want peace for everybody in the Middle East. We want, we want uh, Gaza to be free of Hamas as well. And we want them to be able to live a, a happy and prosperous life. That that terrorist organization, that death cult will be eradicated. And we want Israel to be blessed. And we want Australia to be a sheep nation that blesses the people of Israel. And Yeshua said, if you do it for the least of my brethren, you do it for me. So let's be a blessing to Israel. So thank you, uh, Robin, for sharing your testimony of how you came to faith and also this challenge.